Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight for the second open house for the Rice Street Visioning Project. Um, we had an open house about a year ago now, and we've been doing a lot of work since then and have been doing a lot of digital engagement throughout um, the summer and fall here. So we're excited to give an update on the project during this open house meeting and have some good discussion to get some community feedback. So today our format will follow um, three main points here. So this is a two hour meeting and we're gonna begin the meeting with an overview just to give some background on the project. From there, we're gonna break into three main topic discussions. The first will be discovering what Rice Street is like today. So looking at existing conditions along the roadway. The second topic will be community engagement, which will involve what we've done so far to engage with the community and um, what we plan to do here in the future. And then finally, um, kind of the main event here will be sharing some roadway design concepts that the project team has been working on based on public feedback that we've been receiving. So that will be a chance to share the solutions that we have so far and discuss that. So each of the three topics will follow a format where we'll have a brief presentation and then we'll have breakout rooms. So there'll be small group meetings where people can discuss what was just presented. There'll be a main leader um, from the project team in each of those breakout groups to lead the, excuse me, lead the discussion. And from there, we'll come back together, have a brief discussion about what we heard and then move on to the next topic. Once those topics are done, we will discuss next steps and have a big group discussion if there's any remaining questions. So just a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, please stay on mute during the presentation just so there isn't any background noise going on. Um, if you do have questions, please use the chat box um, so that we can get to all of your questions and concerns. And if your concern isn't addressed in the chat box, um, we can follow up with you after the meeting as well. But please be sure to use that feature. And then finally, if you do have something that comes up during the small group or even the large group, please raise your hand and we will be able to call on you and answer your question. So with that, I'll hand it over to Nick, who's the project manager on this project and he can talk about the project overview. Hi, I'm uh, Nick Fisher from Ramsey County. I am uh, running the project. Uh, I also have uh, Scott McBride with me if he wants to wave or chime in. And then uh, Isla Mays, she can also wave if you want to find her. And then um, Cody Christensen will also be presenting tonight. So it's nice to actually kind of see some faces. We've been doing a lot of online engagement. Um, so it's great to actually, you know, even if it's virtually see somebody and get in a room together. I know we probably have a lot more time on our hands than normal. Uh, so hopefully a few more people can make it to this than uh, in a normal meeting even. Um, so it's great to have everyone here tonight. Um, so what are, what are we doing tonight? What's, uh, what are we gonna learn about on Ray Street? Uh, so our project area is between Pennsylvania and Wheelock Parkway. Uh, kind of that section of Rice Street. And pretty much everyone uses it for everything. Uh, it's a mix of residents and businesses. There's a ton of transit users out there. Uh, there's lots of people walking and biking, going to schools and uh, lots of parks and rec areas. So it's a heavily used corridor for pretty much everything. Um, so what we wanna do is kind of our goals are safety and traffic, uh, community development, business vitality, uh, definitely improve bike and pedestrian uh, connections, public safety, and livability concerns. Um, and then the project goal is to develop an overall plan, just a big layout for what Rice Street's going to be in the future. So that's the main, the main goal. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and then we have a lot more goals, uh, even amongst those, is public safety, uh, bicycle safety, community investment. Uh, promote a healthy community, 
uh, maintain transit service. There's great transit service out there now. Let's keep it going. Um, provide business support, promote economic development, create an inviting environment, enhance pedestrian safety, uh, workforce development, and improve vehicle safety. So these, there's a lot of goals here you don't see at a typical roadway project. They're kind of a community-based uh, goals. Uh, so if there's something, let's say we don't know in this group that uh, maybe another city or county department could help you out with any of these things, uh, that's one of those um, those things that we just want a, a community-based approach to this whole project that's just even beyond just the roadway. And then here is our project timeline. Um, we're right in the middle of pretty much our public engagement, so thank you for coming. So you are participating today in that. Um, preliminary designs, so we're getting into concepts right now and, and tonight even. Uh, so we're kind of kicking that off tonight. And then in 2022 and beyond, we're actually going to build something and, and find what your vision is and put it, uh, put it on the ground. So, and I think we're going to move on to Scott. You're going to take Ray Street today. Thank you, Nick. I'm Scott McBride. I'm the consultant project manager, helping the, the consulting team work with Nick and the, the county to, uh, to do this project. And the first thing we're going to take a look at is just some existing conditions out there. So the key factors we, we, uh, we always keep in mind when we look at the city of St. Paul's transportation plan and the county's transportation plan, they prioritize walking and biking and transit and then automobiles after that. So everything we're looking through kind of goes through that lens. So we analyzed today's conditions on Rice Street kind of in, in two ways. We looked at data that we have available to us that I'll talk about in a little bit. And then we asked you, our customers out there, how Rice Street was working. So I'll go through some of that information today. So first let's look at some data. Um, when we looked at walking and biking, one of the first things we want to look at it is, is the safety issue out there. And so we looked at crash statistics for the most vulnerable users on the corridor. And those are our walkers and bikers. And you're seeing uh, some statistics up there over a five year period. So we looked at January 2014 through September 2019. So this is a, this is, these are stats for a five year period. You can see that 33 people, um, there were 33 crashes with pedestrians out there and 19 crashes with, with bikers for a total of 52 crashes in that, in that period. And just a couple of spots to look at to get you oriented on the map. This is the same scale that, that Nick just talked about on the, the top of the map is Willock Parkway. On the bottom of the map is Pennsylvania. And you can see from the location where these are occurring. So when you look at something like Arlington Avenue, there are eight pedestrian crashes at that intersection alone. Maryland Avenue, seven pedestrian crashes and three, four, five bicycle crashes there as well. So um, it's no surprise probably uh, that at the major intersections, we see some of the, some of the biggest crash issues. Go ahead. Um, on the transit side of things, um, this is a transit rich corridor, which is, which is a good thing. Um, we've noted 17 bus stops out here on Rice Street along the corridor. There are four routes, the 61, 3, 62, and 262 routes go through here. And uh, many of you may have noticed over the last couple of years, uh, Metro Transit has, uh, has instituted a pilot out here to increase the frequency, just about doubling the frequency of service out here. And just a note, we are coordinating very, very closely with Metro Transit on this corridor. And bus rapid transit is something that has been talked about here for, for some time. And Metro Transit is going through a process right now. Perhaps you've, uh, some of you have contributed to their survey on the, that, was, uh, that just happened on the bus rapid transit system. And it is being considered for Rice Street. It's not a given at this point, but it is being considered and our planning will take into account uh, that this could well be a, a transit a corridor or a bus rapid transit corridor in the future. Okay. On the traffic side of things, um, this is looking at that same five year period that I talked about from 2014 through 2019. There are more than 100 
25 crashes reported per year out there. And that is three times more crashes than the statewide average for, for roadways like Rice Street. That's not all streets, that's not all roads, but it's three times more crashes than, call it the Rice Street peer group, four lane, undivided, urban type arterials. Um, so that is, that's an, a pretty extraordinary number. When we look at the intersections along Rice Street, there are nine intersections along this corridor with crash rates higher than the statewide average. So this actually equates to, in that five-year time period, over 670 crashes along Rice Street. So safety is one of the bigger issues that, that we'll be looking at out here. When we drill down into the, uh, the crash statistics, we find that rush hour and summer tend to be uh, the busier times for crashes out there. We also note that the crashes are consistent with, with this type of facility. It's a four lane roadway without a median, we call it undivided. It's got limited turn lanes at, at the uh, various intersections. So we do see a lot of right angles at those inter right angle crashes at those intersections. We see side swipe kinds of accidents that are, that are consistent with lane changing that you see on a facility like this. So um, our takeaway from this is that there, there really is a, uh, an extraordinary crash issue out here that, that we need to be resolved. Okay. Um, just quickly on the, on the uh, kind of the traffic flow side of the things, one of the things we heard early on was that um, Rice Street took a lot of traffic that should be, that, that's going through, that really should be on, on different roads. And so we actually looked at that. And so this is a, you can see kind of a fence line around Larpenter on the north, Dale on the, the west, um, the railroad on the south and 35E on the east. We cut a fence line there and we really looked at some extensive data about how people are traveling through this corridor. And to get you oriented on here, um, the kind of the red maroon is morning traffic and the blue is evening traffic. So, so first I'll just look at the morning rush hour. So in the, in the southbound direction at the bottom, you'll see that 90% of the traffic really stayed on 35E in the, in the morning rush hour heading south. And about 3% of the traffic was on Rice Street that, that wanted to go through. So it's a pretty low number. Uh, bottom line is most of the traffic is staying where, where we want it to stay on, on the big road. Um, sticking with the morning in the northbound, you see 94% of the traffic stayed on 35E and 2% stayed on, on Rice Street. So that's a pretty good number as well. There's not a lot of through traffic using Rice Street. Looking at the blue numbers now, the, the afternoon rush hour in the northbound direction, that's, that's, that's probably the more troublesome of the, the numbers that we see out here. You see 85% of the traffic staying on on 35E with 4% going on to um, Rice Street. And that's a little bigger than the other numbers. And it probably is, is a response to some congestion that occurs on a more consistent basis on northbound 35E during that evening rush hour. In the southbound direction, in the afternoon, 90% um, of the traffic stayed on, on 35E with 3% going through on Rice Street. So I won't, I won't dwell on that. We have actually a lot more information. So um, there, there is more information available if you're interested in that. Okay, and now switching over to what we've heard from the community. We asked the community through our online surveys, um, how does Rice Street work for you? And the first one is the walking and biking, pedestrians. And I think you can probably, probably uh, figure out our icons there. About 14% of pedestrians and 17% of bicyclists are happy with how Rice Street works for them. Um, a greater percentage of the pedestrians say that it doesn't work very well and a, and a majority of both walkers and bikers say that it does not work well for them at all. On the transit side, a um, little higher on the happy side, um, about 43% thought that it worked pretty well. 39% were, eh, it's fine, it's okay. And then 18% said it, it didn't work very well for them on, on Rice Street. And then on the traffic side of thing, the passenger vehicles, um, only about a third of the passenger vehicles said that Rice Street works well for them. 
uh, 45% said, eh, it works okay, it's fine. And 21% said it doesn't work well at all. On the, you can see the numbers on the freight side as well. Um, a, a lower percentage said it works well with uh, the highest percentage being somewhat indifferent to how it works. So the bottom line is if you, if you look at these, nobody's really happy with how this corridor works for them. Um, um, whether you're, you're walking, rolling, biking, on transit or in traffic. Okay. Okay, so with that, um, we are going to go into a breakout session here just to discuss these main topics of walking and biking, transit and traffic, and get some more feedback from the group about those three main points. So our tech expert here, Jen, if you want to send us to our breakout rooms, um, that would be great.
Okay, everyone, kind of got zapped back into this main room now. So sorry if anyone was in the middle of a thought, but um, we'll get back to that. And if you um, didn't get to say your piece, feel free to use the chat function and get your thought down and we can address that at the end or if we can't get to it later on in the session. So I will continue sharing my screen here. Um, give me one second. Get back to where we were. So now we're gonna just briefly report back. Um, can everyone, we can see the screen, correct? Yes, it's on there. Okay, thank you. So we are report back. So I can start with my group, just briefly some main themes that we talked about. Um, one was that walking is uncomfortable because the sidewalk is so narrow and it's also very close to the roadway. So it makes it kind of an uncomfortable and not pleasant experience, especially um, with the noise and cars coming by and maybe going through puddles if it's rain. So it's not exactly a, a pleasant experience here. Another key theme was that um, crossing on Rice Street is kind of a scary experience, especially for kids and in high traffic areas. So that's another key concern that we have. And I think that um, just the main themes were it being difficult for any of these modes of transportation, especially for walking, biking, um, and for driving. So that was my group. Um, Lissa, do you wanna report for yours? I do. Apologies. I was just getting a little another sip of water without everybody watching me do that. <laughs> um, I appreciated. We had um, a great group, um, and we um, asked. I think there was a question asked right before um, we broke out, and it was just kind of how much um, data was actually collected. And I know we're going to talk a little bit further as we dig into these other areas about um, some quantities, but they were asking about the how happy um, data and, and how many people that was. Um, and we, we talked about that, you know, it was surely people that are connected and, and, and are watching this project, um, but that by the in this next piece talking about community engagement, why we have decided to go um, further and reach and try to reach further. Um, we can't reach everybody that's, that's you know, we would love to, but, um, understanding that that you know we're trying in multiple ways to get to as many people and to understand everybody's concerns. Um, somebody uh, also mentioned kind of their their goals, which I think you'll see align with a lot of things that um, the a lot of other people in the community said. One, a vibrant street, you know, walkable to explore. She said that she um, that has thriving businesses and, and is welcoming, so that she there are businesses that uh, she wants to support just by randomly walking down the street and finding a business in which to go to. Um, currently kind of going to Rice Street for very targeted things, but she wants to be able to like just park the car and, you know, or walk to the, you know, walk to Rice and be able to kind of explore um, the community more. Um, you know, I, I heard I heard destination in Main Street um, and without, the, without displacing those that are there. So I think that there's a clear understanding that um, Others that are there are, are, are that are there currently as business owners are, are of a value, which we all agree. Um, and then we talked a little bit about um, the crash data as far as um, the biking and um, car crashes, and um, if that was more about um, along Rice Street or if it was cross um, crossing Rice Street. And I know that. Um, I know that we we have the data. I, I don't know how it's broke. I know it's not broken down in this presentation, but um, and I think that's something that we have at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and I, and that was that was about it. And we got, we we all got sucked back. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Lissa. Hyla, do you want to report for your group? Certainly. Um, I think some of these themes are obviously going to keep repeating because they're similar across here. But um, we did hear um, from several people in the group about related to the. Concerns about crossing the street, um, the level of safety, a lot of concerns about the youth and children in this area because this is a lot of young people and making sure it's safe. Um, the, the walkers and experience of a walker is, is a can be challenging here. Um, there's definitely some maintenance and deferred maintenance issues, which is understandable considering the state of the infrastructure and the age of it. Um, 
there's a civic tribute to a, um, a gentleman who was known as Bones who lived along this corridor and somehow had been part of the informal program for keeping this area picked up. Um, but a, for a person experiencing homelessness who's I think no longer here, it's that's that's not a that's not a a, pr a pretty well defined maintenance plan. So some discussion about how how this is designed in a way that can be maintained and can and feel safe and comfortable and attractive as far as a public space. Um, noting the many T intersections along this corridor. This is a corridor with a lot of T's and that means there's a lot of places to cross. And while that's of course legal to cross there, it's not, it doesn't, it's, it can be a lot of things to keep track of for, for people along here and to think about is there a better way to prioritize crossings. Um, uh, there's uh, also issues with weaving traffic, going around parked cars and left turners, um, calling out Rice in Maryland as a dangerous intersection. And just things about are there ways to make this a better place for people to walk and to be out and about, um, make it more attractive and appealing as an experience. Thank you, Hyla. Nathan, do you want to report? Yeah, so I had we had a lot of residents in my group. Um, so I'm not gonna, I, I think the general consensus is that rice is bad and especially bad for pedestrians. Um, and I think that was kind of conveyed in a couple of the other discussion groups. I think some of the, the couple of things that came up in my group that I didn't hear yet. First was about the work that we're doing on rice. They want more details and kind of know what is proposed. And I conveyed that, that that's part of the discussion that we're gonna have at the end of, end of this conversation. The other is about the impacts to other streets and other corridors, specifically Jackson. Um, Assume knowing that obviously the improvements on on rice, how is that going to impact what happens on Jackson or traffic and things like that? So is there some work being done between um, the two corridors? Um, and the other thing that came up is is that making sure we're getting input from a diverse audience, to getting people of color to the table. And right at that moment when we were starting to talk about that, Kyle was talking about some of the artist engagements, and he got cut off. So. <laughs> Oh, the breakout rooms, they're always gonna suck you back in. <laughs> so um, next group is Nick and Cody, if you wanna report. I, I can report on that. Uh, I think you hit most of the topics already. Um, a lot of our people weren't surprised by what Scott told us about traffic accidents and bike accidents and pedestrian accidents. It was just like, yep, we can totally see that. They weren't, weren't very shocked by that. Um, one question was, um, is there any uh, near misses or anything like that reported on that, on our numbers? And uh, basically, no, unfortunately, it just is basically the police report uh, of, of what happened after the fact. I'm sure there's a near miss every hour out there, um, which has to change. So that's basically a, our gist of our room. Thank you. All right, so thank you for your input on that first topic. We are gonna now move into the community engagement piece. And just a reminder for everyone, we are gonna talk about the proposed solutions for the roadway as part of our third topic. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to explore those. So right now we're gonna get into um, what we've done and how we've gathered the survey questions and data so far from the community and what we plan on doing in the future. Hello, um, I'm going to kick this off and Lisa's going to be available too because we've, we've, this has been definitely a team approach as you'll see from our, our strategy. Uh, the Rice Street community, which I think is not news to anyone on the line today, is a very diverse one. And I think when we started thinking about the engagement strategy, we started thinking about who is in the community, who are we trying to reach, what is the most effective ways to connect with the population out here. Um, a, a very diverse community, people of color. Um, a very young community, a third of the community is, is children, effectively. Um, a very high foreign born resident population and a number of people who do not speak English as a second language. A quick note on that, this is obviously in English. Um, however, we're not, and we thought for a format like this, it, it was likely that that was probably the best to stay with one language, but our intent is to continue to do outreach um, in other languages and more focused conversations. So just for anyone who's keeping tabs and wondering about that, that is certainly part of this. and we indeed have some bilingual people on the team who um, you'll hear from a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our engagement strategy and some different strat um, attempts at what we've done. I should say attempts because when we started out in late 2019, this isn't exactly how we thought we'd be doing this meeting. Um, clearly, um, the world has changed in front of us. And I, I'm very grateful for the creative people who are involved in this team 
and for our very understanding community to sort of work with us to sort of um, think about how do we engage in this space and still do it safely and in a way that's respectful, but also get real input. So the existing condition stage really wasn't supposed to last all the way to July. It was supposed to be a little sooner, but that creates some flex for us to help us understand um, what's going on. At the beginning of the process, we did have some in-person engagement and some online engagement topics. Um, we had some pop-up events that were actually in-person pop-ups um, and without social distancing because we didn't need it back then. Um, and a, a number of, a couple of different surveys at that point to online and in-person and updates in the community liaisons. I'll have a little more about them in detail later. I'm just gonna go through the, the structure right now. The toolbox of ideas, again, this is our transit, transitioning into COVID world. Um, we had an open house of, sort of on the front, that's uh, we're currently talking about now, but the main features were really a series of online engagements um, that we have sort of been rolling out um, with, um, Okay, yes. <laughs> Scott is co commenting that there's a number of numbers here for those of you who like numbers. And if anyone likes <laughs> numbers, we have many numbers. We have reams of information and there will be a documentation of all this for people who like to keep count and like to see. We've had hundreds of engagements, including online. We've been very pleased with a number of people who've been willing to participate in this toolbox series, which we'll get a little more information about next. Um, we have also done a couple, three socially, I guess four now, um, socially distanced pop-up events that um, have allowed us to continue some of the in-person engagement in a safe way. Um, we have additional stages, potential solutions and chosen design that are forthcoming. This just carries us through the current phase. Um, clearly, we do not have it fully mapped out for the next phases. We are abiding by health and safety guidelines and something like this is expected to continue for the near future. But we continue to be flexible. And if before the end of this process, we're able to do it again without restrictions, I think we will all be happy for that. Next slide. Um, say, uh, I was going to just uh, well, go ahead and I was going to turn it over to Lisa to talk a bit about our, our in person engagement and liaisons. Yeah, I, thank you. And I was just going to just tag in and say the exact same thing. Um, so here we're showing you um, one of uh, several of our um, in person uh, COVID uh, post uh, or start of COVID times um, visioning um, engagements. Um, in person. Uh, we have actually, I believe all four of our community um, artist liaisons are on the line. Um, and um, if they wanted to just pop their faces up um, or put a um, emoji in the corner of their screen, I don't know if you'll be able to see all of them, um, but they are floating about um, and are in, um, have been in, in each of the small groups. Um, and they've, they've had the real creative energy to um, find safe ways to interact um, with everybody. I think that um, I can't imagine a non-COVID version of them because they are so creative and so talented and, and how much uh, more, more we would get um, of, of, their, of their experience and the benefit of their knowledge and um, being of the neighborhood. Um, I think we could talk, go on the next slide. Um, so just to give you kind of an example of our digital engagement. Um, so there, there's on the left here, you'll see uh, feedback from um, our surveys. So these were the different, uh, the different topics that we we covered. And then there were reminders that were to remind us um, to go and fill out this, this work and um, these toolbox kits. And so I, and they, and they broke down. Um, I think that these were the design and intent was to break these down into pieces and components so we can understand kind of the breadth of uh, and, and options that, that um, people are looking for and are interested in for rice. And I think that the artist team came up with that beautiful hashtag revision rice and um, they, they are continuing to develop ways in which uh, to, to get, engage and reach people and they will be doing stuff over the winter that, um, that, is, that is exciting that you guys will find, um, that you guys, you being the neighborhood, um, will find out in, um, in locales along Rice Street. Hearing a lot of background noise, excuse me. Next page. Um, and these are our community liaisons. I, again, if they wanted to um, unmute themselves and just say a quick hi and, and who they are, um, I, will, I will be quiet for 30 seconds to allow that. Oh, they're all shy. Hello, everyone. My name is Melvin. 
<laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Krista Beyer. Hi, I'm uh, Kajal Melissa Vang. Hello, uh, I'm Kyle Voigtlander. There you are. And they've done a they've done a great job, I think, learning learning more about each other and learning uh, more about um, using their talents to to flex um, engagement. And and so uh, I want to give you you know a, a big help uh, you know big much appreciation for that. So um, I think next. So what we had heard from the first open house, um, <clears throat> or a lot of the themes that we've talked about already. So pedestrian crossing safety, um, especially near the schools, and that there's high traffic speeds. Um, we want better community connections, um, the potential for bike lanes on rice, um, you know, some congestion, public safety issues, um, and the need for youth and student engagement. Um, you know, this is a public works project, as Scott said in our group, this public works project um, that has gathered and gotten a lot of attention from the other, um, the other areas of um, city and county officials um, to start to look at um, a uh, look at Rice Street holistically. So, uh, so in our toolbox phase, uh, we found some needs and some concerns. Um, so the needs, you know, prioritizing businesses, um, transit, non-motorized users, and vulnerable pop vulnerable populations. So the children, the elderly, um, and people uh, with limited mobility. Um, you know, and that there, there are concerns about traffic. And so a lot of these things aligned with the things that we heard in person. Um, and, uh, you know, worried about maintenance, winter maintenance on non, for, for, of non-motorized facilities. So, um, you know, we had to think about all of these things as we continue um, through this process. Um, so, um, and then <clears throat> we had uh, introduced, excuse me, <clears throat> This, the input ID comment map. So uh, I don't know if if many of you have uh, within this group have gone on to this um, wonderful site and have um, had the opportunity. You can pinpoint and mark uh, and and leave a comment, and then your neighbors can leave a comment on top of that comment. And so um, <clears throat> we had 22 initial comments, and then people were, and then 18 replies um, about things that were liked, and then uh, you know people more seemed uh, strong, more strongly to comment and reply to uh, dislikes and concerns, which means we, we, we are listening and, and we need and we and these are the these are the concerns that people have. And I did see a comment asking where that was and I'm sure somebody will respond in the chat um, as to where to find input ID. Um, so um, so far, major takeaways that we've gotten were to give high priority for pedestrian and traffic safety, particularly at the intersections and crossings. Um, I think we've, we've heard that in all of the groups. Um, to carefully consider bicycle and transit facility options and how they fit with other modes. So really making this um, a very useful um, corridor for, for all sorts of types of travelers. Um, and then supporting the community beyond the roadway with economic development, business vitality, public safety and livability. And now we're gonna have, oh, go ahead, Nicole. <laughs> we have a guest speaker here coming on the screen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, thanks, Lissa. Uh, so as Hyla and Lissa shared, we've been doing quite a bit of community engagement um, since the project began last fall through in person. And then after COVID hit, we've really focused our efforts on engaging people online through um, engagement series. And the data that we collected through the online surveys and the short videos that were presented um, on the website were used to inform all of that feedback that we just shared with you initially during the existing conditions, and then also um, to analyze the trends and challenges that we're seeing from the community. So now we're gonna have a breakout session to discuss what you're seeing and what we've been hearing from the community and um, learn if there's other avenues we could be connecting with you and um, just sort of see how we can better be gathering input from the community and if we've missed anything so far. So if Jen could take us to our breakout rooms, that would be wonderful.
and we are all back together here. Good to see everyone here. Scott so, was hitting a really good point. <laughs> what'd, you, what'd you say, Alyssa? Scott was hitting a really good point. <laughs> and then just, Bleh. Yes. Scott, do you want to finish your train of thought? <laughs> No, it, it was, it'd probably take a while to set that up here. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just I'll set it up when we get around to our team. When we get around to our team. to the I'll vortex and mid-sentence. Mm-hmm. That happens. Okay, so we're back. Um, I will start by reporting back for our group, which we coined the best group, so sorry, everybody else. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the comments that came up is, um, they want to see more of the hashtag being used. Um, they really like the, the idea of that and we think that could definitely be utilized more. Um, then Kyle gave an update on what he's been doing as a community liaison and he expressed how he's really liked this opportunity because he lives right here in this area and the fact that he can engage in his own community has been like a blessing to him. So he's really enjoyed that experience. And a question came up of, I asked the group, what do you think about the liaisons and that method of engagement? And they really like that because they're more of a neutral party, if you will, and have some commonality with the area. So that's been going really well. Um, and then lastly, another point was, how are, how are we reaching businesses and making sure that we're connecting with those and Kyle touched on how, because he lives in the area, he can hop over to a, a restaurant or wherever it may be and, um, and chat with those owners. And I also mentioned that we are going to continue to have meetings with businesses, especially small businesses along the area so that we can help um, those businesses thrive through this project. So that was my group, Lissa, do you want to report on yours? Yes, maybe I will see Scott up a little bit, but um, we kind of reflected back on what um, what what was presented, and you know, it, it was not of any surprise um, both the challenges and the benefits um, that were presented. Um, you know, and then there was a comment about how does rice really operate? Um, you know, it's it's called as a four lane road, but is it really because the the parking and the and the the ambiguousness of that, um, and 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 that was so that was something that we, we discussed a little bit, um, and then you know and in all this data collection, particularly of the surveys because people are on their their keyboards, um, are we getting you know people of the neighborhood responding to these surveys um, or are they kind of uh, road enthusiasts and 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 people that want to skinny up every road everywhere at at, at all costs. Um, or you know, add things to roads that might not necessarily be appropriate for um, a particular area. And um, so I think Scott kind of touched on that a little bit and said, you know, we do have data. We haven't really parsed it out, but it is something that we ask um, exact, you know, ask by zip code where you were from. So um, in those responses, um, and then we started talking about public safety data and how we we're working with other the other. Um, other areas um, of creating kind of a holistic piece here and um, you know have we been collecting it and Scott was starting to say that we hadn't been collecting it but we were working with the council members in the areas um, that we are touching for this project um, and getting to know the police officers and have been attending their events to get a better understanding um, at the at at the street level um, and that that was that was pretty much it I mean that was 10 minutes goes by quickly it does. Thanks, Lissa. Hyla? Certainly. Um, I, uh, we had a really good discussion. I, a lot of it ended up being focused on business um, engagement and how we're engaging businesses that exist in the area. Um, we, we were lucky enough to have Melvin in our group who was able to talk a, a bit about the liaison's work and how that when we've done these community-based engagement efforts, they have partnered directly with businesses, including some safely plan and carefully planned giveaways and other activities with really the goal of building that community relationship with the businesses and supporting them and being very proactive in doing so. Um, we also talked about, of course, the plan to continue to engage them in different ways. That's not, not hardly the only way, but that was certainly a priority. Um, I think that 
there was a comment that it felt like the, some of the priorities coming out of it felt about right in terms of the approach. We got some thumbs up and thinking it was moving in more or less the right direction, um, especially with the pedestrian safety focus being one of the themes we were called out, um, and the thoughtful approach to transit and buses um, along the corridor. Um, we had some questions, which I think we'll probably um, tag for follow-up information about specifically related to the volumes of traffic and as far as through traffic and 35E. Um, as I said, we have reams of data which we can share and we will certainly be having follow-up to this meeting to sort of share back out more detailed information about that, um, but certainly thinking about through traffic versus local traffic being concern. Um, again, we had, we're fortunate enough to have someone from the city, Angela, to join us to talk about the city's role in looking at business and, and economic development along the corridor, and that is certainly part of the consideration. It's not just about the roadway. And some compliments about just the, the creative nature of the engagement. So that was that about wrapped it up, um, unless there's anyone else. Not. Thank you, Hyla. Next, we'll jump to Nathan. Thank you. So I think something that didn't that came up in this session, which is actually going to be some a, a major topic of the next section, is really what is the corridor and understanding we have limits in the right of way. Um, that we're working with and we have to kind of prioritize. And I think it came from one of the questions, um, carefully consider bicycle and transit facilities. What does that really mean? And, and, and how does that impact the correct quarter and what are our options? So hopefully we'll get into that discussion in the next breakout session in more depth. Um, I think the public safety issue actually came up as a, as a fairly significant individual, specifically from one person in regards to being able to envision these improvements without addressing public safety is a, is a big deal. Uh, because there are shootings and there are car thefts and there are issues um, along this corridor and, and, and addressing those are important as well. Um, in regards to um, engagement, what they something that came up, but I don't think I heard it from any other. So definitely the business side um, is important, but um, there's a diverse group of religious institutions along this corridor. So making sure that we're touching all those communities and also really thinking about the facility in the context of families and kind of engaging the schools and the libraries and, and parks and other places that, that are used by um, families and youth. Thank you, Nathan. And last group, Nick and Cody. Uh, yes, our group uh, kind of focused on the pop-up events and thankfully we had uh, uh, Melissa and Krista with us to talk, kind of talk us through how they came to being and, and uh, one of them where we gave away plants and another one where you gave away ice cream and kind of just kind of bring bring the project to the people in the street to kind of find people that don't normally come to these project meetings that are actually on Ray Street using it every day. And um, one question that did come up right at the end, right before we got cut off is are the liaisons, you know, local and they're all very, very close. I live very close to Ray Street, if not on it. Um, and that was a requirement uh, to being on the team. So, and they're invaluable to our team just for that fact too. So thanks to them again. Awesome. Thank you everyone for your feedback on that section. Um, now we will get to our final topic before we get to the next steps and questions of this. And that is kind of the main event here, the potential solutions. So I will kick that over to Cody and um, we can begin the presentation here on that. I'm actually gonna start this one off. Okay. Nicole with Scott again. Um, and this, uh, this slide right here, I want you to take note of it because you're gonna see it twice because we think it's that important um, just to, to kind of pinpoint where we are in this process. A Couple of considerations that we wanna make sure you're aware of. Um, this is about a two mile long corridor. We do not anticipate that this whole corridor will be one major reconstruction project at once. Um, in order to minimize disruptions to business and travel out there, um, focus in on the areas that, that really need the biggest change, we anticipate that, that you could see something like a, a portion of this corridor being reconstructed, others being upgraded uh, in, a, in a, call it restriping and, and kind of wait for their turn. So it's not, not necessarily this whole corridor going to be uh, reconstructed at once. Another is um, you're about to see a variety of, of street sections that we'll show you. And um, you, you, don't, you won't really necessarily want to think that one section will be in place for the whole way because 
the the right of way width varies throughout this corridor. Um, there may be areas that need parking more than others that allow you to do some different things. Um, and so we think we can we can flex these options by by segment. And then lastly, um, we're still at a pretty high level right now, earlier in, earlier in the process. And details for these will come later. For instance, we're, we're not looking in detail at intersections right now, but we know that intersections are, are a big deal out here and there'll be a lot of design work done on those. Um, transit service, continuing to coordinate with Metro Transit and thinking about a potential future BRT is something that we will do. So there's a lot more details to come in this process. So we're, we're still pretty early in the, call it the design phase. Next one, Nicole. Um, we're, we're taking kind of a toolbox approach. And so over the last um, couple of months, we, we rolled out a different, uh, a number of these various tools and we asked people's opinion on what they would like to see on RICE for these, these tools. So we had pedestrian facility tools, things like improved sidewalks and shared use paths, bicycle facilities on street and separated lanes. Um, we asked about safety and uh, lane configura configuration out there. In, in other words, the existing four lane roadway. Um, we asked about parking as well. And we asked about uh, improved streetscape. What types of things would people like to see out there? So that's a lot of the, the feedback we got. And that that feedback really input into the sections you're going to see. Next. Um, and then this is important as well. Um, early on in the process, we, we set out what the goals of the project are. On the left side, you'll see our transportation goals, um, safe pedestrian accommodations, safe bicycle connections, improved transit service, safe traffic operations, and a welcoming streetscape. Um, and we mentioned earlier, I believe that, uh, you know, this is a public works project, but it touches so many different facets of life that we're also going to evaluate these options against community goals and criteria as well. How do, how do they uh, treat economic development and does it support business? Um, are there opportunities to develop workforce and uh, encourage employment in the area? Um, health issues are part of our criteria as well. Public safety, we talked a little bit about that in our, in our small group, and it uh, sounds like a couple others did as well. And then community defined goals. So we're getting kind of out of the, just the street aspect and getting into the community with the evaluation goals and criteria. So we will take the sections that you're about to see and we will, we will kind of weight those sections against these goals and criteria. And you'll see that further down the line. So with that, um, Cody will take over. Cody Christensen is a design engineer for our team. He specializes in multimodal uh, bike pedestrian planning and design. And Cody will lead us through what some of these uh, sections are. So Cody, go ahead. All right, thanks Scott for the intro. Uh, happy to be here tonight and, and go through these, these options here as uh, everybody has alluded to so far in tonight's meeting. So uh, first off, just wanted to give an overall look at what's out there today. Um, you know, as we've mentioned, four lane roadway, um, center two through lanes and the outside lanes are um, sometimes for parking, sometimes uh, not. And so that can be a confusing uh, scenario as you go down the corridor. Um, and then behind the curb, we have uh, about a four foot uh, boulevard where we place things like street lights and benches and um, trash receptacles and signage and then a six foot sidewalk on each side um, and depending on where you are on the corridor that boulevard might be concrete it might be uh, landscape with some grass um, so this is kind of where we where we're starting from um, and this is the the typical kind of 66 foot right of way that we're dealing with um, along a majority of the corridor. Uh, as you get a little further north, the, the roadway, the right of way does widen a little bit. Um, and so we'll take that into consideration as we progress through our alternatives. Um, so if you wanna to go to the first concept. Cody, before you move yeah. on, do you wanna explain what right of way is to those out there who may not know? <laughs> yeah, uh, so that is uh, owned by the public. So um, in this case, it is owned by 
uh, Ramsey County. Um, and that is the, the area that we are able to work with uh, for our uh, corridor enhancements. So outside of the right of way, uh, that is private property uh, and would take either property acquisition or uh, easements uh, in order to work outside of that, that right of way width. Thank you. That will help clarify. It just gives a context that we have a certain amount of space that we're playing with to try to fit these different solutions in. Yep. So I'll, yep. I'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. And on, and on the south end of the corridor, the, the building faces are pretty much right on that right of way line. So if you want to go to our first concept, so, um, so on this one, we have uh, a three lane roadway section. Uh, so you have a, a vehicular through lane in each direction with a uh, what we call a two way left turn lane um, that gives you the opportunity to, to make a left, um, no matter which direction on the roadway you're going. Uh, this has a, a five foot bike lane um, that does not include any of the, the curb and gutter width. Uh, and then we have our our four foot boulevards, uh, planting signs, light poles, et cetera, and uh, six foot sidewalks. So um, in this one, our, our sidewalk, our back of, back of curb width is very similar to what's there today. Um, and we're kind of working differently um, what's in the roadway itself. Um, and there is, you know, an option um, here that depending on where you're at in the corridor, um, there's a potential to eliminate the center turn lane and add um, parking on, on one side of the road um, behind the, the bike lane. Uh, so concept two, uh, again, has that same uh, three lane roadway section uh, however, on uh, this one, um, on one side of the street, we have a, a two-way separated bike lane facility um, to, to help get those bikes in a more um, comfortable facility uh, outside of the roadway with the uh, high number of traffic volume that's out here today. Uh, and then we have a... Um, Essentially, a, a five-foot sidewalk on each on each side, um, with our with our boulevards between the pedestrian bike facilities and the roadway. Um, and again, here you have the opportunity, uh, again depending on where you are in the corridor, to eliminate that center turn lane um, for the possibility of of parking on one side. Uh, so our third concept here. Um, follows that same three lane roadway. Uh, however, on this one, on this one, uh, we have uh, the pedestrian sidewalk on one side with the boulevard. Um, and on the other side, we have a proposed uh, shared use path uh, that would be wide enough to allow uh, bikes and pedestrians to use the same space uh, to travel up and down the corridor. Um, with again the same the same option of that uh, possibility of parking on one side. So I'll let that sit for a second, and then we can go to concept four here. So now we're changing up our roadway a little bit. Um, for this one, we're looking at a two lane roadway. Uh, so we've lost that that center turn lane, um, and in place we have a an eight foot median. Uh, that can serve as a pedestrian refuge uh, at some intersections um, where uh, that would be welcomed. Uh, and then we have a wide 10 foot sidewalk on either side of the road with our five foot boulevards. Uh, concept five here uh, has another two lane roadway. Uh, this one they're running uh, on an undivided road, so there's no median. Um, and that, that gives the room then to have a 
uh, eight foot sidewalk and a one way uh, six foot separated bike lane on each side of the road. Um, so with a two, two way roadway, um, these single uh, one way bike lanes uh, make it are much easier to, to work with at intersections. Uh, when you get the two way facilities that can make those intersections a little more complicated. Um, so that as, a, as a consideration as, as we look to move concepts forward. And then um, this is our, our sixth concept. So this one um, is a little more closely resembling today. Uh, however, it would have dedicated parking on, on both sides of the road. Um, so that does allow um, a wider pedestrian realm with an eight foot sidewalk and a six foot boulevard on each side. Um, and this uh, concept would have the option of having some uh, curb extensions or bump outs at the intersections uh, to further uh, minimize the, the roadway that has to be crossed for pedestrians and bikes. Um, and then this is our, our last concept here. Uh, so this one has the, the three lane roadway uh, along with parking on one side. Um, and this one then has a, a sidewalk on, on each side of the road. Um, and again, this one could have uh, bump outs along intersections um, as well. There could be um, medians at the at the intersections and um yeah i think that covers it so just again to touch on the the slide that that scott talked about earlier on um you know to bring it to your attention again here um we're not saying that the road will be constructed in in one project or reconstructed in one project um, as we work through our, our concepts and, and ultimately our um, preferred alternate, uh, we'll work through an, uh, kind of an implementation plan on how the, the whole corridor vision can come together. Um, and you know, to note too that the options, the concepts that we just went over, um, we aren't in any way suggesting that that one concept can cover the entire corridor. Um, there, I think we've looked at about four different segments of the corridor where the context can vary uh, from being, you know, urban business centric at the south end to um, a couple blocks of, of suburban uh, residential to um, suburban um, commercial at, at the north end. So. Um, and there's also the possibility as you as you go through and provide your comments on these concepts that um, some of these could turn into some sort of hybrid of options that are are liked on one and, and disliked on another uh, could converge into one future concept. So um, just because you don't like one thing in one concept uh, doesn't mean uh, that we can't get some good feedback uh, on other pieces of it. Um, and as we go into the future here, uh, we'll work to refine these down um, and get into to some uh, corridor long uh, kind of plan view, bird's eye view, look at the corridor. And that's when we'll start to uh, look further into the intersection designs for pedestrian bike and traffic safety, as well as uh, working at our transit facilities. All right. Thank you, Cody and Scott for that. Um, with those concepts in mind now and some different configurations, we're gonna go into a breakout session and discuss initial reactions to those. And we will have Jen zap us into our rooms.
All right, everyone. That's the last time we're going to be in a breakout session. So welcome back to the main room. I'm going to bring the presentation back up here. All right. Um, so we're going to, my slide will flip. There we go. Um, so great conversation in our group. I will start for the reporting back. Um, one of the comments that was made was there's a lot of concern about bike safety that we've been hearing in data and some of the options did not have bike um, facilities in that in the option and Scott's response to that, which was, um, I thought hit the nail on the head was usually bike facilities are 50 50 either people really love them or they really hate them. So part of our goal for this will be able to. Um, hit just the right note so that we're having facilities that are safe for people of all different um, backgrounds so that it can be used for people along the roadway and it's continuous and it makes sense. So that was one main point. Um, another comment that was brought up is uh, people passing in turn lanes. So that seems to be an issue currently where people are, you know, they're getting fed up with someone in front of them and they're going around using a turn lane, which obviously is a safety issues. So just something to keep in mind as we're designing those solutions. And then at the end, we were having a really good conversation about youth in the area and making sure that we're engaging them along the process for these different design concepts because they're the ones who are using, you know, the roadway so often and crossing and going to schools and libraries and such. And um, I think there was even a comment made um, correct me if I'm wrong, that there was like a small focus group once and like all 20 kids in that session said that they had at one point been hit by a car <laughs> along Rice Street. So it's definitely something that we want to make sure um, that we're purposefully engaging with the youth during um, our, our engagement with the different roadway designs to make sure that this is something that works for them too. With that, I will toss it over to Lissa to report for her group. Okay, I will, I will quickly try to see if I can sum this up. Um, there, we had talk um, around um, how to navigate segments with bikes and without bikes. Um, I, the, the person that made the comment um, was concerned about coexisting with um, parking. They said, you know, I love the idea of having bikes, um, you know, and, and, and multiple, and varied ways to um, move about, but that um, parking, there are gonna be key areas where parking is probably going to be very important, you know, around the community center and, and the library and the ball fields. And um, so if we were to really to go to a four to two lane diet, um, how does that really accommodate the cars and, and parking and, and really, and also transit and, and moving people safely about. I mean, we've, we've talked about congestion here as well. So, um, and, and then we talked about that, you know, a shared use um, bike, faci bike facility as it's term, terminate, terminology, the terminology is, um, is, is share, is, is difficult because, um, you know, the, the speed at which a biker may be moving and, and a pedestrian and, and kind of having that space to freely roam um is is kind of kind of hard i think i i mean i heard and i even saw in the chat before we broke off um and i don't want to misrepresent my group but um that concept um concepts two and five um seem to be pretty good but really worried about um snow removal for the bikers um so in, in when they are um when there are opportunities for bikers off off the actual Rice Street itself. Um, and um, then there was a thought about um, the businesses. Um, and I see I see Ian making a, a, a litmus test. I like it. Um, and um, congregating parking by segments. And I know that as we ex continue to explore into the next um, bit of this, as we take all this information in, um, and I know that it was alluded to that we were talking about segments and that was just kind of based on typology of what's happening along the corridor um, that, yeah, there's going to be kind of an, 
kind of a, a you know cross of of several of these. Um, I don't think I saw anybody that was strongly in favor of one particular thing, uh, and nobody was strongly strongly objected to anything. Um, but again, those were I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth, but those were the those are the high level points I think I've, that we came across. Thank you, Hila. And thanks, Ian. <laughs> Certainly. Um, just to talk a little bit about this, um, we had some a fair amount of discussion about the bike lane segments, especially the separated bike lane ones. And I'm seeing some comments in the chat that are resonating with that too. Um, the idea of that there's it provides a variety of mobility choices along the corridor, that there's different ways to travel, then um, there maybe need to be some variation by segment, but that including that is going to be important. The idea that that could increase in accessibility, including for people who wheel themselves around, um, people who are in wheelchair and mobility devices. Um, concern, and I think that was mentioned also too, is is the need for maintenance of those so to make sure that they're, of course, if they're not plowed regularly, they're not going to be as useful. So the plan for maintenance will be an important part of that. Um, the There was a discussion about the, the, the benefits of having a center turn lane because people weave a lot, um, especially in the segment south of Arlington was called out particularly to say just, just going to feel safer when people can pull out of traffic for their turns as opposed to people dodging around them. Um, some concepts uh, can be changeable by, by block because some blocks need on-street parking and others don't and, and just predictability and the knowing where parking is as opposed to sort of where it is kind of now, which is sort of randomly located at some points might be good. Um, we have some comment that went a little bit off topic in terms of the, the section, but I think it was important because we're trying to capture all input. Someone saying, "Is was this the most diverse group of people assembled and saying, you know, maybe maybe it wasn't. Um, but we also had at least a start of a good conversation about the fact that this event, as important as it is, one of many things we're doing, and that as a team, and Melvin got to spotlight some of the great work he's been doing, um, we're committed to finding a lot of different ways to engage people and to bring all the voices to the table. So a little bit off topic, but I think it's pretty important to our mission, so I want to mention that as well. Thank you, Hyla. Nathan? Thank you. And by my own admission, we got we got away from the questions. Um, we spent a lot of time on the bike facility. Um, I think we started out, I think there's an important piece that my group identified um, right away is that this section has to vary along the corridor. The north part of the corridor is significantly different than the southern portion of the corridor. Um, my group did bring up that the businesses really value parking in the southern portion of the corridor. Um, there's a limited right away down there. Um, and then I think I got a soft topic because I really wanted to know about um, the bike lanes and and I think we got some pointed comments about the bike lanes where it's not safe right now to ride along rice um, a lot of people did not like the idea of riding along rice the those facilities aren't there right now there are a lot of questions about should we be using a different street so should we be using Jackson or a street similar to what they do with university and using Sherburn as kind of the bike pathway so that definitely came up um they did indicate that maybe there is a segment north um, that the bike facilities make a lot of sense because that can connect with other bike facilities um, that are in the northern parts of, of the corridor. Um, and then we also talked about the bikes and the need for people who are using transit to have some bike facility to be able to access kind of their transit options. So there was, there was a lot of conversation about that. Um, as we were kind of, there was definitely a desire for a wider sidewalk um, for sit from a safe pedestrian safety wide standpoint, so wider sidewalk and boulevard. And kind of the last comment that kind of came up at the very end was that turn lanes are important at specific areas, but it's not important along the entire corridor. Thank you. And finally, we'll go to Nick and Cody. And uh, we'll kind of probably repeat what's already been said. Um, there was a lot of talk about winter maintenance as if you have a bike lane on the outside and it snows and snows and snows more each, every event your bike lane gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Or if there's parked cars there, they keep creeping towards the travel lane. And then there was talk if there was a median, there's really nowhere for those cars to kind of shift themselves over if there is a, a random biker out there. So it's, it's, it's a good thing to note and even um, if there is a separated bike path, where does all the snow go if you have, you know, a sidewalk, a bike path, and then, of course, all the snow from the roadway. So that is something we definitely have to figure out. Um, 
but it was a it was definitely a good conversation and i think the off street was uh kind of the highlight of the conversation great thank you everyone for your feedback um just a reminder that this is the very beginning of this process of looking at these different options and um part of our next stages of engagement will be taking feedback and continuing to get more feedback and analyze new options. So with that, we can move on to appropriately the next step section. I'm not sure who's taking this slide. I don't have that in my notes. I'll do that when I get unmuted. <laughs> Sometimes you have to say things twice, I've noticed <laughs> lately over the last nine months. Um, Oh, hello, Connie. How are you doing? Um, just responding to chat. So I'm going to, uh, I've got two slides left here. I'll just really quickly go through uh, next steps and then we'll open it up just for some conversation until eight o'clock. Um, so our next steps are this, this open house is part of a, about a two month process of, of kind of having an open house, virtual open house, continuing to gather information. And so through the end of 2020, we'll continue to collect information on, on this part of the process. Um, and then we will start to analyze those, those alternatives in a, in a uh, big way, putting pen to paper, um, continuing to get feedback on those alternatives as we go through the process. So very similar to what we've done over the last two and a half months, um, surveying people, getting information online. Um, our liaisons um, are doing some really cool stuff um, outside of this computer environment that we, we find ourselves having to live in now. And they will continue to do those over the winter. And as we, uh, as we kind of go through this process, do the technical work, communicate with the community, we intend to report back um, in spring of 2021. So about five, six months from now, we'll be back saying, here's the, here's the refined, here are the refined alternatives. Here's the feedback we have gotten on those over time. And, and that will take us into the, the final part of the process, which is getting down to that uh, uh, preferred alternative and starting to really develop that. So those are the next steps at a, at a very high level. And, and if you can hit the next slide, Nicole, this is a, a, just a sample of a tool that we will be using that you'll, you'll see in the future. And I mentioned uh, the, the toolbox approach that we have. Um, we, will, we will analyze all of the alternatives and solutions that we have and the tools that we're using against the goals, as I mentioned earlier, that, that were developed as part of this process early on. And we'll, we'll, we'll measure those, we'll, we'll quantitatively measure the ones that we can and, and qualitatively make assessments about things that, that, we, that we can't really measure. Um, we will do the technical work then, we'll really analyze how these, these various alternatives will operate. Um, we'll start to get into some of those uh, ancillary issues. I mean, uh, one of the last ones Nick mentioned was, you know, how do you maintain something when it's put out there? You know, thinking through those kinds of things as we go through this. And at the end of the day, um, we hope that uh, we will reflect the community priorities and concerns when we, uh, when we uh, have this alternative. Um, so this is a huge part of the process. And of course, this open house gets at, gets at the, uh, the opinions of the people that are here today. We've got many other tools that we're engaging along the way to, to get different opinions too. So that's the, those are the next steps in, in, in this uh, process of kind of working through the alternatives, evaluating them against the goals and criteria to come up with, a, with a, an acceptable solution out there. Um, so now we want to uh, have some conversation and we, we can take the topic in any direction you'd like to take it here. We can use the chat box. Um, you can certainly uh, just weigh in, unmute yourself and, and ask a question. So I'll, I'll be quiet there and, and uh, allow people to, to speak. And I'm just kind of reading through the chat here that came in while I was talking. We appreciate that. We are recording the, the chat in this main room. So um, that will be part of our, our record as well. 
any any thoughts or questions, clarification um, that people would like to have? Um, Lisa had a question actually. She um, brought up a, a point about how youth engagement is going to be um, very important to the success of this project. And she wanted to ask a question to the community here saying, how is a, the best way to connect with um, your schools in the area? So opening that up to the community here to answer. And I will frame it a little bit more. Um, we uh, had our first open house and some of you may have attended um, at Washington Technology Magnet School. And uh, you know we had been uh, working with a couple of individuals over there um, try to figure out a way to set up in, into their, um, into a program, into um, finding a way to engage youth. And um, kind of as we were starting to get into, you know, some ideas and, and some kind of uh, something to, to move forward with, um, it was, uh, it, you know, COVID happened and now we're all distance learning and um, you know, administ school administrators and, and staff, um, you know, are both moving and um, trying to to adapt and adjust. So, um, Trista, thank you. I see that that would be great. We'll develop something. We'll get something. We'll figure out a way to to, to engage the sixth grade class that she, that uh, she's just mentioned in the chat um, that she has a friend at Washington Tech. So that would be great. Oh, uh, Kim, uh, so where's your hand? Yeah, sorry. Also, um, we were just on a meeting today with the administrator at the Community School of Excellence, which is right off of Larpenden. And she, they have a really robust social media and Facebook group. And she offered to share information with their community, um, most of which who live in the neighborhood. So that would be another great connection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I had I had a question because I can't remember all the concepts, but um, there was one concept that had uh, parking on both sides of the street, and I can't remember. Did that concept also have a boulevard um, as part of the sidewalk? Was it this one? Yeah, it did. It did had six foot boulevards. Uh, I was thinking one thing consideration is that uh, in winter, especially, um, you know, parking. If you have the sidewalk right up against the street, uh, like what you do on Grand Avenue, for example, or various places, like um, the parking provides a kind of physical and psychological barrier for pedestrians um, against cars moving in the street. Um, but when you have it, you, you don't necessarily have the boulevard on top of it. So, you know, maybe another concept, you know, 6.5 might, might be, um, you know, you would get an extra six feet of room if you didn't have the boulevard um, or, or something, I, you know, I don't know, would, is a thought. Yeah, definitely. Makes sense. I'm curious, uh, and maybe this is something that's already been talked about and I've missed, um, so, you know, feel free to correct me if that's the case. I feel like Rice Street has a ton of off-street parking. Is that the case? Am I wrong? I, I feel like that must have been uh, considered at some point during this project. Yeah, I would urge them, I would urge to map it. You know, I know some businesses have made huge parking lots. Um, so it just sort of depends, but, I, oh. but it would be interesting to map it and just sort of see, you know, per on a block basis, how many parking spaces there are in lots versus on street or? Well, I do think that south of front, between front and Sycamore, there is not, I mean, you have one lot, but the majority of it, it's small, real narrow streets. And so you don't have a lot of parking there. And now you're building the Rice Street Flats right there on the corner, that's gonna take up more room. And there's no boulevards. In some of them. That we we actually did a a, a parking survey. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was done the last fall. There are a couple yes. of parking studies that that have happened. Um, I want to say about 2010, Nino did a parking study. It was pretty pretty extensive, and um, it 
really looked at kind of a theoretical need for parking. It, it actually looked at, from a, at a higher level, the land use in the area. It looked at on-street, off-street parking that's there. Um, it made some, it, it actually said that, that there's more parking, there's pretty high capacity use of the parking there. We actually went out last fall, we got a little bit of a different result, but we did a different study too. We simply went out at varying times of the day, looked at spaces available and whether or not they were filled. Um, and we found that there was excess capacity of parking in the area, but it was one sample. And it's also, I think, informed by the issue that's come up here already is that that parking lane is there sometimes, it's not sometimes. People don't really know whether they should park, don't know whether they can park safely if they do park. Um, and so uh, I think there's just a little bit of confusion about the parking out there that, that, that adds to people not wanting to park on Rice Street when, when in fact they probably could legally, but maybe shouldn't just from a safety standpoint. Well, this is the oh, I'm sorry. This is Janice Rassett. And what we're talking about as far as parking, right now, when you look at, let's say even South of Maryland, um, we have so much vacant businesses right now. We, it, and if we're talking about making this vibrant, well, if, if you're going to be bringing in more businesses or more, you know, um, you know, stores or whatever it is, you're going to have to have some kind of parking. And I can see for the upper half of, of the project that you wouldn't have that issue as much as you would between that front and Sycamore area. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Janice. Yeah, and as you as you think about uh, you know a vibrant Rice Street that's uh, really kind of living its best life, I think you you see the ability to park some, um, access by bike, access by foot, um, access by rolling, and and just convenient and safe access for for all of those various modes. I think is is uh, what you strive for. Scott, can I just jump on? I was going to say that we did have some additional resources for this project to do some additional parking counts um, to, and I think the intent was maybe earlier this year to do so to, to provide some additional data if we needed to do to look closer. Um, it was such a weird year. It was not a good year to do typical counts because all the travel patterns are messed up. But I, I think the idea is that we could revisit that in the future. We could get additional information if needed, especially when we get down to the much more detailed block by block analysis. So. Um, it's, it's just, we're very, very mindful it's an issue and especially for certain folks, it's, it feels like a make or break concern. So we, we, can, we can look at that more closely as we move forward. Thanks, Sila. I, I would also like to highlight the fact that, um, you know, St. Paul, the city of St. Paul recently uh, adopted their, the skip, the um, something something resiliency action action plan um, <laughs> about about making making our city uh, more environmentally friendly and um, you know one of the one of the core parts of that is like getting people out of their cars and having people not drive to destinations and so like one one part of that of course is making making biking and transit and, and walking more friendly, but also we need to accept that like making things a little bit less convenient to drive and to park, you know, in the places that you want to go, like that is a part of the puzzle as well. Um, so I think having like a little bit less parking than what is like would currently be in demand that's a part of like building the world that we want to live in, uh, not building the world, building for the world that we currently live in. Mm. Thank Thanks, you. Ian, and, and, I, and I, I won't speak for the, the city or the county here, but kind of, um, that is reflected in the, the plans that, uh, that we are, are having guide us, you know, and that, that priority of walk, bike, transit, and then automobile in that order. And so I think that's that's certainly a reflection in those in those plans. A lot of what you said. 
I also just want to raise a concern about about crime because honestly that's my biggest concern i'm not concerned about like can i park at this restaurant if there's gunshots two blocks away from me and police everywhere which there were last sunday night so that's where i'm at i want to know why this is happening um you know putting a camera up just seems to drive the crime to different streets and it doesn't really solve anything. So that, that on my registration form, that's what I put. I'm interested in potential solutions and crime is my biggest concern in this area. Not parking, not bike lanes, not potholes, crime. I think you raise a really great point, Kyle. And I totally agree that it's a huge issue there's also uh, an opportunity through engineering and good design that is crime reduction, uh, crime reduction due to community design. And I think we have an opportunity. It won't solve all of it, but that with all the uh, making, it's gonna make a really big impact and we'll continue to do that work together. But this Ray Street redesign is a huge part of what will be um, crime reduction if we get it right, which is why it's so important for us to keep putting that up in the conversation and in the forefront and that we make it an issue for our community because it is a part of it and good design will help reduce our crime issues. And I just want to say too that this is Karen and I'm with Nino, is Nino and the county and the city, both Ward 1 and Ward 5, the police department and some nonprofits have all been um, rolling out some things to address the crime in the, in the area. Um, things have not been going as, as fast as I would like, but you know the, the, the pieces are starting to come together that um, ideally it, within a few months, we'll really see a significant improvement. Right, and part of part of what helps deal with the crime issue, and it's important to me too. You know, I spend a lot of time on on Rice Street. Is that um, you know more cars on Rice Street doesn't solve crime, uh, but having lots and lots of people on Rice Street. You know, if it's an activated street, you know where there's people going to businesses and doing things and and out there on a routine basis. Well, that helps tamp down. Doesn't maybe solve it, but it helps tamp down. Uh, the, the, the crime that occurs on Rice Street or and and certainly uh, the discomfort level right if it's a comfortable place to be then people will be out there if it's not a comfortable place to be then um, then we're just going to have some people out on Rice Street um, we want everyone out on Rice Street thanks Rich and thanks all for those comments it, it, there's no question the very first meeting we ever attended Public safety came up. I suspect it'll come up at the last meeting we have on this, and, and it is absolutely at the forefront of, of what we're thinking about. So we are approaching our last minute here. So if anyone has any final thoughts, um, you can share that now. But otherwise, this presentation will be uploaded to the website, and we'll be putting together um, a summary and a follow-up questionnaire. So um, stay tuned for more information with that and be sure to sign up for our email updates so that you can um, get those updates and share your feedback using the survey. Thank you all very much. Um, a lot of really good conversation, a lot of great, great information in the chat. Um, I, I consider this meeting to be a pretty good success for, for uh, getting all the feedback that we got from you. And we really, really appreciate your time, taking time out of your busy schedules to, to help us work through this. This is, this is, it's been awesome. So any last comments before we sign off? There was a question about asking how we get the survey. So if someone wants to. Yep, so we will send that out through the email blast and it'll also be posted on the website, which is listed here on the screen. So be looking for that email and that will be a digital survey. All right. Great, thank you. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. And Thank a great you. Thanksgiving. Thanks, you too. Hey, there's everybody. <laughs> See y'all later. Okay.